So good evening. It's February 13th, 2024, and we're in our next collection of discussions on the Outside the Class series. This is another series from Tim Mackey. It's called Eat This Book. And I get it just because it sounded fascinating to me. On the dustofeat.com, in the Outside the Class section, we have the Eat This Book source video section set up for review, right? Because the purpose of Outside the Class is for you to listen to the in-class lecture first. That would be in the source video playlist. We don't have a new one each week. That's one reads out for weeks sometimes, but we do want you to listen to it. Because with this way of doing things, you can watch the video before we begin chatting. We still hope to keep these two around 15, 20 minutes or so. That's just because we want to make them easy to catch and easier to catch up on. So we're going to continue our Eat This Book series with The Call to Sacrifice. And this is part one of three on Outside the Class on the Dusty Feet. And before we forget, you find these kinds of podcasts useful, that's when you click the subscribe button. Because the reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think these might be useful to others, that's when you click that like button, because that is the way that YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. So, the call to sacrifice. Eat this book. Part 1. So, we finished our first two sections of Eat This Book with God brings blessing out of curse and God brings life out of death. And then that brought us to the beginning of the scroll of Leviticus. As we mentioned before, this is this entire series. It's being taught by a few different members of the Black Hawk Community Church. We are only covering Tim's episodes of teachings. So we've actually made quite a jump from the story of Joseph to the scroll of Leviticus. Because he opens up with trash cans. You know, we produce waste. It needs to be put in appropriate places because it's not to be there in the living space. Stim brings up the point to us about getting in a rhythm of taking out the trash, right? The trash belongs where it belongs, and we need to remove it. But Tim then guides us to his point of us beginning to understand the animal sacrifice in scriptures that we find them brought up and taught about in this scroll of Leviticus. Let's not forget that this is not the first time by any means that we're in Gauged with sacrifices, right? We see them all the way back in Genesis chapter 4. And also, of course, many points in between. But yet, this is the first time that we get the explanations of maybe the whys and the hows, right? That things that God is expecting to be accomplished in the land that God is giving them in order for these people to care for and to cultivate. So I like that Tim reminds us that in, in this whole Eat This, Eat this Book series that they're working on to, uh, they want to read through the scriptures. But that's not the goal, to read the whole thing. What is the goal is that this becomes a habit, not only with the individual, but more as a, a community, right? They're all engaging in reading this book. So in my head, I... Uh, it wraps around and fits with me with breaking bread. Yeah, we eat daily. It's a habit for sure, for most of us anyways, because I am very much aware and I'm humbled that it's not that same fact for a lot of people around this globe. But my point here is that even in that context, that it is both a singular and community thing, right? So the habit of listening to or reading of this collection of scrolls which at least be as important, both individually and communally. Rhythm and habit. We even build that into meal times. We have rhythms and habits, breakfast, lunch, dinner, or 11 Z's or whatever. It depends if you're a hobbit and you have seven different meals. But I was having a conversation with some folks recently, and we were talking about something related to this, and, and I brought up a point that we kind of need to keep in the back of our heads for a couple of reasons. Because we need to remember that we've only had these scriptures available to us for personal use for around 100 years, give or take. So people did not own and truthfully had limited access to the Bible as we know it today, right? 
And, and even so much later, right, for those whose languages it hadn't even been translated into yet. So my point is that people were reliant on the teachers and such to, to tell them the stories, to read it to them, to pass on the text, to share. Most often, and we even have reference to it in Scripture, is that once the text was read or the story told, then teaching and discussion followed. Because my point is that today we're in a time unlike any in history, right? We have a we have personal copies. We have binding of choice. And if you're like me, I have it in soft form. We have multiple translations and support material, all the palm of my hand. So I think we need to remember that this is really a very, uh, what we're going through is new in history, right? We are, we are more fortunate than any before us. And maybe we need to remember two phrases. One is from the scriptures in Luke, maybe to whom much is given, much is expected. And the other is from a, it's a community phrase. It, yet the quote, it's actually attributed to a Haruki Murakami, right? With great knowledge comes great responsibility. We have unprecedented access to so much. We can devour so much at times. So much we can confuse ourselves with so much. Probably more than we think. Yet I like the thought, I like this thought line um, that we do today what others have not been able to do in the past. We can make this a rhythmic habit, a singular and communal habit, you know, in eating this book. So then we get to Leviticus and uh, we get to the sacrifices. So I'm not sure if that drives you to eat this book or not, yet here we are. Now here is where Tim and I, we're going to differ a bit. I have, we have varying thoughts and opinions in regard to Leviticus. Of course, we have varying thoughts and opinions on Torah as a whole, so I expect as much. But I won't apologize to you for needing or having to read through Leviticus, because I see it as a peek into the culture of the day for the children of Israel, uh, a chance to see some of the expected behavior, the practices, and maybe some of the traditions that developed from these life-giving instructions. Those are God's words, not mine. We get a glimpse into the culture and the, uh, and the constitution that God gives them to use in this land that he had prepared for them and was giving to them to occupy. There's a lot to read about here and probably easy to get lost in since much of the cultural relevance is very much lost on us t today. Um, and, I'll, and I'll probably suggest maybe a certain bias that's been injected over a thousand so years and we've lost the connections between God and his chosen and the, and the significance of these instructions. So remember, like Tim points out, we are in a story, and at the beginning of Leviticus, it puts us in a place that is only understood with the stories that precede it, right? We are in the, uh, the tent of meeting, and it took a lot to get us here, right? The entire journey, the stories of the Exodus, have brought us to this meeting at the foot of this mount. This prophet, called by God, it, it gets words to share to these people. Side story. I love it when unexpected things happen and I'm, and I'm not surprised anymore. I just get to smile if I'm aware of those things at, at the moment. Because in our Sermon on the Mount series, we're going through with Tim Mackey and John Collins and the folks at the Bible Project, that we're at the foot of another mount. Many, many hundreds of years in the future for the folks in this story. Yet in that series... I became compelled that these two Mount events, Mount Sinai and the Sermon on the Mount, that they are inextricably intertwined. They are, for practical reasons, a practical analogy, part one and part two of a series. Because I think we're going to have trouble grasping the fullness of the Sermon on the Mount without understanding the first Mount experience. You know, the words of the prophet here, 
will help us understand the words of the prophet there. I enjoy the way Tim explained a certain point that he was making that was about getting them there, right? That God showed them grace and forgiveness getting there. And much of the Exodus story tells us that. So now, God is sharing his expectations, his instructions, his guidelines for living within this covenant, um, the one that they, in fact, all had agreed to. So this tent of meeting, this uh, tabernacle, we know it from Exodus. It, it might be obvious to some, maybe not to others, so it seems a good time to make note of a few ways of, of communicating in Scripture. We have... We've covered these before on a number of episodes here on the Dusty Feet. We have patterns, and then we have word and phrase repetition. So patterns, like chiastic patterns that guide us to points of emphasis. We have word and phrase repetitions using the same exact words or the exact phrases in a story to remind us of other stories and then find out how they connect in some way. And then there's this seemingly obvious one, it's detail, right? When Scripture goes into great detail about something, it's probably something to pay attention to. Because I found it interesting how much of Scripture is really left unsaid, little detail, and most often we just fill in all these things for ourselves, right? Because there are lots of parts of stories that we fill in the, the colors and the textures. We enjoy that, and there's good and probably maybe some not-so-good parts to, to doing that. And yet, when there is detail, it seems to me for us to, uh, to take heed, to pay note, to uh, pay attention. This tent of meeting, this tabernacle, it's a detailed space. It's a set-apart space. It's a place that God would choose to meet with whom he chose at the times that he chose Hopefully, we'll get more on that later. Tim reminds us that we are, uh, when we're reading the Bible, and I'll make mention that it's not just what is oft called the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, but actually the entire Bible we have, that it's always a glimpse into another culture. I want to also remind us that as we often forget that these stories build on one another. They are not a collection of disconnected stories, right? Stories that we pull out and we use at will. They build on each other. So here is a picture that we often forget to really consider, the explanation of the events that surround the tabernacle. And we'll be discussing a lot about these sacrifices. These continued in and around the tabernacle, right? in various locations of the tabernacle was taken for well over 400 years, right? Eventually, it gets moved to Jerusalem, and then they build the temple in Jerusalem. And that's built by King Solomon, and that's, say, around 1000 BC. Then after that, the temple was destroyed about 586 BC, and then it was rebuilt. That's the second temple period, yeah? And that was completed about 70 years later. There's a longer story behind that. And then it was destroyed about 70 A.D. I know it's a short history lesson, and yet during the times that the tabernacle and the temple were active, what we're engaged with, these activities, these events that we're talking about, they'd happened for around 1,500 years or so. So these were very real and very active behaviors and activities. They were even that in Jesus' day. Heck, even in Paul's. So maybe we need to take the time to, as Tim put it, to be in the position of a learner, one who is seeking to understand the story that they're hearing about, to, to seek to understand the culture and the activities that are part of this culture. Yeah, Tim brought up a, a good point to consider. We need to understand two things, that there are two parts to these sacrifices. We have the actions in the activities, right? Um, there's the meaning of the sacrifice and the practice of the sacrifice. 
maybe another way to say it is the why and the how, right? The meaning is the why, why it's needed, why it should be done. And, and then the how, this is the way it should be accomplished. So let's remember in context that in this example that starts in Leviticus, this is only one of many sacrifices. They each had a way that it worked. This one in particular is for atonement. This will be the very first sacrifice ever accomplished in the tabernacle area. This will be the one that sets the way. Although um, we do even here get a few generalized instructions to heed. You know, if the offering is for a burnt offering, because not all, all offerings are burnt. And if the offering is from the herd or the flock, it should be a male and without defect or blemish. Then the man brings it to the tent, lays his hands on it to make an atonement on his behalf. There's so much there, so you can ponder that at will. But I find it interesting that we often tend to read stories in Scripture and we're told how bad they were, how much they screwed it up, how wrong they got it, yeah? I wonder how brutal and rough folks will be in the future reading about us and our part in the biblical story. Because I have a sneaky suspicion that we don't even stop to consider that, uh, that scenario, yeah? How folks would see us in the future as we're viewing them in the past. Maybe we think we're not part of that story, that the story that we're reading about, maybe that's why we don't like Leviticus, because we don't view it as part of our story, and we're just disconnected. Maybe we lost the why. So next week, we're going to pick up on this, uh, this topic. We're going to see more about where Tom wa Tim, <laughs> Tim walks us through this challenging section of Scripture. And I want to thank you for being with us tonight again on another edition of Outside the Class, The Call to Sacrifice on the Dusty Feet. <laughs>